My guest today is Dr. Regina Lark. She's a certified specialist in uh, chronic disorganization, ADHD, and uh, hoarding. And uh, she's an author uh, and a speaker. She's been featured on a and Hoarders, The Wall Street Journal, and The LA Times. And also, you have a business? Yeah, my business is called A Clear Path, Professional Organizing for Home, Work, and Life. So we're going to talk about time management today, and, and, and I know that you help people not only with organization, but also with time management. How do you help people manage their time? I mean, what are the things that when you walk in to talk to somebody about their time or when you talk to them on the phone, what's the first step? You know, really, time management is kind of a misnomer because you cannot manage time. It's this fixed thing. You've got 24 hours. That's it, <laughs> you know? So what you have to do is figure out how to manage your day, how to manage your, your relationship to those hours. So folks who are feeling like they're always behind the eight ball, they're, they're screeching in at the last minute to clock in, or they're, um, they miss, they always miss the first half of their child's game. Uh, they're not able to make dinner plans because their friends just know they're always going to be late and they're, you know, they've got this terrible reputation. They are, um, they're always filing an extension for their taxes. You know, there are, you just can see that their life is filled with, with issues related to their relationship with their watch or with the calendar. And so we really have to start the conversation with where they live. It's like, well, what is it? What happens? Is it that you don't really understand how long it really takes from the time you wake up in the morning to the time you have to get to your, wherever you have to go on time? It's like, well, what is it? And part of the conversation is to look at time from a historical perspective and time pieces the chronic use of wearing a timepiece or having a clock in front of us these are relatively new social constructions on how to be human prior to the invention of the watch and the clock, human beings structured their day according to the sun. And, you know, when the sun came up, you got up. When the sun went down, you went to bed. And we were not, especially people who have a brain type that's not organized, linear, cataloged. If you don't have that left brain type, then the chances are pretty good you're going to be struggling with your watch. So now you have these folks that are chronically late, they're not able to get to where they need to go on time, and part of it can be resistance. You know, they're fighting it, they're rebelling. They feel that they grew up in a very strict and structured household, that they're gonna go the opposite way. A lot of folks uh, are chronically late because they have no idea on how long, about how long it takes them to get anywhere and do anything. And a lot of folks are chronically late because in a simple way, they're using the wrong time pieces. If you are somebody who is always working to the last minute, never getting any place on time, my first suggestion is to move away from digital time pieces into analog. Because when you're looking at the face of a clock versus 1052, 1052 tells you nothing about what came before and what came after. Yes, we know it's 10 to 11 ish. But we don't have a sense of really visually how much time we actually have to 11 o'clock. We can do it numerically, of course. And some people need that visual, I guess. If we're not habituated to it, if we're not thinking about what comes before and after, the chances are going to lessen 
about when we can, when we will get something done. We talked earlier about um, getting organized and chronic disorganization. Another piece of that is to understand one's learning style. And if you're a, a visual person or an auditory person, if you're tactile, uh, if you're kinesthetic, if you want, you know, if, if, if you're somebody that will find success by moving around a lot. Uh, for example, I had a client, a uh, very right brain creative, very smart, and very kinesthetic. She's, she was bodybuilder. She just loved moving, loved moving her body. And she wanted um, uh, an office, uh, a bedroom where all the clothes were picked up off the floor. To pick up the clothes and put it on a hanger and put it in the closet on some level was just outside her bandwidth. Being a kinesthetic person, what we did is we put really cool decorative hooks on the wall, and now she flings her clothes. <laughs> the hook. It takes care <laughs> of the problem with the stuff on the floor. It's a creative, fun way to get the clothes off the floor, and it allows her to move her body. She's making like dunk shots behind her. The pants just get flung. <laughs> and for her, that was the solution. And so understanding one's um, learning style. So if you are a visual person, you really want to have evidence of a visual timepiece. And so what room, whatever room you're spending most of your time in, and you're a chronically late person, then I would put an analog clock right in my line of vision. I want to be able mm -hmm. to see what's coming before and what's coming after. So switching from digital to analog may be of help. Another issue that folks have is that they are not really clued in to how long it takes them to perform a particular task. I used to say, uh, I think it takes me 20 minutes to get up and out in the morning. And then I timed myself and it took me 25 minutes. I mean, five minutes is not a big deal, but if I was chronically late to things, then um, that five minutes adds up if I'm, if I'm constantly right. missing the, the cue. So folks who have this, this lousy relationship with time, uh, here's what we do. The night before the beginning of their week, if they're a Monday through Friday person, you know, if they work seven days out of Whatever it is, however you see the start of your week, the night before, get a piece of paper and write three columns. And the first column, every single task that you do. Open your day timer, look at your calendar, note every single task, appointments you have coming up, places you have to go, include wake up, shower, get dressed, eat, get ready for the day. Those are all tasks we don't put in our calendar. Mm -hmm. Right. Big problem already. Because in our conversation <laughs> earlier, we talked about you're going to increase the likelihood of your success in completing a task if it's on your calendar. Since we tend to not calendar brushing teeth, washing hair, eating breakfast, and yet those are tasks that we do every single day. We have an assumption mm -hmm. of how long it takes us to perform, perform the daily activities of life or activities of daily life. It's ADL. And okay. so I say, brainstorm with yourself. Make the list of ADL also meetings, appointments, anticipating how long you think it takes you to drive to certain places. When I'm scheduling clients that live a distance from me, I will not schedule our session to start at 8 a.m. Because unless, unless that's really important to them, if it's that important to them, I will leave my place at 6 a.m. to make sure if I get there at 7 a.m., I'm golden. I have plenty of work I can do on my iPhone. I'd rather get there much earlier than deal with the stress 
of arriving much later. Yes, and I think people have to get people who are chronically late. Uh, there, you know, it may not be a big deal to them, but for some people, some of your clients, it's a huge deal. Being on time, they judge uh, you very yeah, harshly. Yeah. I mean, that's just that's the cardinal sin. You make me wait. Yeah. Forget you. Um, so people have to realize. I mean, I'm I, I'm acutely aware of that. Uh, and I do like what you do only because I can't trust myself. I actually wind up always getting th places or often getting places mm -hmm. way early because otherwise if I got there, if I wanted to get there when I thought it was, yeah. I would be late. So now what I do have to do, what I haven't been able to do too well is is to have those things that I can do <laughs> right. Right. while I'm waiting. Because I wind up feeling like I, I my schedule is too loose. Well, one thing that you could do is take the time to um, unclutter your car, <laughs> reorganize your trunk. <laughs> I'll do that sometimes. I will. I'll, I'll just stand in the back of my car and because I have all kinds of uh, organizer supplies and just different things, you know, tools that that um, I can bring in. You know, if all of a sudden I say, oh, we need to get my big bag holder because I have this really fun thing called trash bag buddy. It's a bag buddy. And I can put hefty bags on, and the hefty bag stands up like a little soldier. And so, so I always find a way, or sometimes I'll even take a nap. I'll just close my eyes, and I'll, and I'll do a 15, 20-minute power nap if I'm early. Oh, wow. So now you have a list of everything you have to do, all your appointments. The next column is you write down how much time you think it takes you to do it. Just, just let it fly. It takes me... Uh, a minute to feel fully awake. Uh, it takes me five minutes to be in the shower. I can I can gulp down my breakfast and you know just whatever it takes. Getting ready in the morning, putting your bag together, um, putting your clothes, getting your clothes out. Now you're out the door. How long does it take you to get from your door to your car? How long does it take you to get from the car uh, in the car to the freeway? Just just pull out a number. Then you've got a list of everything you have to do. You have a list of everything you think, every way, you, uh, how long it takes you to do all of these tasks. And then the next morning, when your week begins, keep that piece of paper with you all week and start noting actual time. You will be amazed before you are halfway through. It is an <laughs> eye opener. It's an avalanche. By Wednesday, Thursday, you're like, smack head, roll eyes. You're like, no wonder I can't get to any place on time. I'm getting so caught up in not, in not putting together enough time to get from my car to the freeway. And depending on what time of the day I leave to get to the freeway, it will take me double time if I do it at 8 a.m. and it'll take me much less time if I'm doing it at 10 or 11 a.m. So building in the emergencies of everyday life into a schedule will go a long way in giving you some good resources on how to manage that relationship better. Another strategy is to really get your priorities. And in our earlier conversation, you would ask me, well, what can people do to help themselves? And I, I would say it with um, putting together a decluttering project, and I, I say it with um, understanding uh, your relationship to time. I keep pointing to my wrist because this is where I usually wear my watch. Um, <laughs> Being clear on your goals and, and do some brainstorming with yourself. Journaling. I'll do journaling with clients or we'll create a vision map. You know, my approach to all of this work is both metaphysical and physical. Because we have to change our thinking about a lot of stuff that's going on around us, one thing we also have to change our thinking about is our relationship to time. So I, I ask if there were some problems in childhood. You know, did they get in trouble for being late? And is this a rebellion to that? You know, it's, it's 
so much of, of how we operate today uh, started in childhood. <laughs> you know? We can blame our parents for everything. Or did it happen when a transition happened in your life? You know, the big transitions of life, marriage, death, divorce, empty nest syndrome, aging parents. We talked earlier about sometimes I'll meet with, I'll connect with a household that they've got all of the stuff from the aging parents. They moved into assisted living and no one knew what to do with grandma's dishes. And then their 30 something uh, adult child, as a result of this recession, uh, had to give up their apartment and they're moving back home. And, and, and now you've got three generations of chaos living under one roof. I always want to see if we can connect with why things happened, when did they happen, when did you first start noticing? Oh, I was talking about transitions. So marriage, death, birth, divorce, emptiness syndrome, aging parents, any of these, uh, a debilitating illness, any of these can get you off your game. These are the big ones of life. And we don't recognize mm. the impact of the big transition on our activities of daily living. I connect with a lot of people who seem, who felt pretty organized all of their life. They never had a time problem. They were always able to find their stuff. But the big transition or the shift happened. And then they start walking in and they just put things on the desk and they'll do it later. And then they do it again and they do it for two or three weeks and then the pile builds and they're looking, I don't know, how, how did that happen? I don't know what. So to find the clarity about why or when. You know, we all hear knowledge is power. I'm like, it's what you do with the knowledge that will really empower you. So knowing why. Clients will say to me all the time, I don't know why I bought that. I don't know why it's still here. I always respond with, get a knowing. Let it become known to you. We often will say, I don't know, because we don't want to admit what we do know. We may shop because mm. we're lonely, angry, tired, frustrated, or depressed. Well, we don't want to tell the organizer because then they may have a judgment about it. So I really am very clear about developing a knowing. Why don't you want to let it go? Well, I don't know. It's like, well, did you pay a lot of money for it? Well, yes, I paid a lot of money for it. So maybe you don't want to let it go because you're kind of embarrassed that you paid a lot of money for it. And now you're finding you're not even using it. Now you got, yeah, that's exactly why I don't want to let it go. So knowing why you have a lousy relationship with time, because you got to have a starting point. You have to be able to know where you can begin the tweaking process. So the columns and then getting to understand how long it really does take you. That knowledge will allow you to start making shifts in your day. You either have mm -hmm. to get up earlier or you have to start allowing for traffic in a more meaningful way. You have to believe that traffic is always going to happen. And if it doesn't happen, hooray, you'll get someplace early. But if it does happen, you'll get there on time. So what about getting tasks done, right? We have, I have these, uh, and I think a lot of people have these to-do lists that are constantly rolling over to-do lists. Back in the days of uh, yellow sheets, you'd spend uh, half an hour every, every day moving things from one to yellow sheet to the next. Uh, how, how do we deal with this and get more done, or is the, getting more done not the answer? For folks who are really struggling with this stuff, here are some suggestions. First, I'd get away from the yellow notepad. The thing about the yellow notepad <laughs> is that you're bringing sheets up. So there's, there's a lot of movement around. So you have to bring sheet up put it down and then scan the paper. I said earlier that it's important to understand your learning style. I'm a very visual person. And so I still use a, yellow, a, a spiral notebook. And I also still use my day timer. Plus I'm visual. I do put my appointments on a Google calendar 
but that's because other people need access to my calendar now. But for me, when I am on the phone setting an appointment, I open my day timer and for me, and it's all about me here, that's what I use to keep myself organized. Um, my spiral I like because I see both pages at once. I date the pages on the top and it corresponds to what's in my calendar. There was a reason in, in school they always made you put the headings on the top of the paper. A really good reason. <laughs> I will keep a spiral for about 18 months after I finished using it. The chances are pretty good if I need something in there and I don't have the spiral anymore, I'm not going to die. And that's always worst case scenario for me. <laughs> if I don't have it, I'm going to die. I will reference it every now and again. In fact, I referenced the spiral before this. I needed to get a phone number and I had a very good idea when I jotted it down and it was in August, uh, it was in early August. This spiral starts in early September. I go through about one a quarter. Wow. So I went right to the other spiral. I opened it, flipped through a couple of pages and I found the number I needed. But again, that's how my brain is processing all of this information. One of the ways that this stays successful is because my spiral is really my, my to-do lists. I tend to put personal professional in the spiral. Some people want to separate it. That feels like over categorizing for me because the personal and professional all have to do with me. Right. Well, especially since you work out of your home. Yeah. It's again, just for me, this is what works. When I had a desk job, I always had an eight and a half by 11 spiral on my desk and that's where it lived. I don't believe I carried one otherwise. And did you put your personal stuff in there at the time when you had not? Mm -hmm. I did. Okay. I really did. But it never left my desk. This goes out with me all the time. One of the reasons why I'm able to use this to success is not only is the page dated, but the tasks that are on there either have to be done that day if I have several days in which to complete the task, I put the date that it's due for um, a long list of things. If I have a whole bunch of stuff that I need to accomplish in that day, I'll write everything down and then I'll start prioritizing. I will see the, you know, I'll look at it if, if, it's, if it's errands that I have to run. I will create the errand so that it makes sense geographically. Right. You know, I, I won't drive all over town. If it's phone calls I have to make, I'll write down the time I'm going to make the phone calls. I think to-do lists have a greater chance of being checked off if we assign a date and a time for the task to be completed. Mm. If we don't, what happens is, is what you just said. It moves from one list to the next list to the next list to the next list. Yeah, until it becomes irrelevant and then you cross it off. <laughs> or you miss the deadline. Right. Every task that you need to complete has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And th there's a good question, though. Talk about People talk about it as a time management strategy, uh, time blocks. Do you, do you sort of believe in blocking out blocks of time? Or? Sure. If... If you're somebody who is struggling with getting tasks completed, I recommend getting a timer. A lot of folks with ADHD or chronic disorganization, they're just chomping at the bit to get up from their desk. They don't want to sit there and do the work. It's boring. It's tedious. Understanding yourself, understanding your skill set, what you're really good at, what you have the bandwidth for. If you know that you cannot sit for four hours and do filing, break it up. Get it on your calendar from nine to one. We're going to do filing, but I'm going to set my timer 
so that I get up and do something enjoyable for about five minutes. Whether it's to, okay, so enjoyable for me is wiping down my countertops. I mean, it really <laughs> depends on, on, you know, enjoyable for me would be to um, uh, finish the dishes. I didn't get to, I didn't finish my breakfast dishes before our call. Okay. And so, uh, so that's something I'm going to want to complete before I get to my next appointment. It's, it's breaking up the time. Again, that knowledge of self and how you function and operate at your optimum. It's like if you're somebody who's a morning person, don't do your filing at night. You're, you're putting yourself at just at, at, at a huge disadvantage. Um, so developing the inner knowing, coming to understand how long it actually takes you to complete a task. A lot of folks have to-do lists that you know, there's some mundane stuff, but really important stuff on their to-do list. So another way to tackle the time issues is to really come to terms with what are your priorities. Stephen Covey is famous for his time management um, books and materials. Mm -hmm. And Covey came up with what's called the time management matrix. And if you Google it, you could put it on your site. It helps us organize our brain to what is important and urgent, what is important but not urgent, urgent but not important, not important, not urgent. Okay. So I'll give you some examples. Okay. Important, urgent. Child's hand is getting ready to move toward the stove. <laughs> Drop everything, grab the child's hand. Right. No brain. Right. Okay. We tend to act quickly on important and urgent. Then you have important, not urgent. Going to the gym. Uh -huh. Right? <laughs> It's important to our overall, our, our overall well-being. Mm -hmm. We're not going to die if we don't go. Well, eventually, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> there are exceptions to all of these, but that day, yes, right. We won't die if we don't go. How do we make the important stay important enough to actually go to the gym? Not important, not urgent, going to the movies, scheduling the fun time in your life, taking a good walk with a friend. Uh, you know, it's the, the, the time management matrix really is there to help us create the balance in our life. We've got to be able to plug in all, all four quadrants. I have... Um, I'm really challenged with the so-called balance. I've convinced myself that I love working all the time. <laughs> I love working with clients. I love my coaching calls. Um, I really enjoy um, uh, marketing and networking and I, 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 I enjoy public speaking. There's so much about what I do that I love, love, love. When I'm kind of left to my own devices, I'm either bored or not quite sure what to do. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just I, had to put on my calendar, farmer's market Sunday morning. Because what will happen is Sunday morning will come and if I don't have a client on my calendar, I'll start doing clear path work. Mm -hmm. It's just a default position. And so because I know that I'm challenged when it comes to the fun part of life, like getting on my bike and going to the farmer's market, I have to put it on my calendar because it's not necessarily a default position. There are a lot of people out there that not urgent, not important, that's all they want to do. Right. <laughs> because the other stuff is too tedious. And if you're right brain creative, it may be important that you file, but it's not urgent, so you're going to go, I'll do that later. Right, right. Yeah, I was going to say for, you know, when you were talking about the not important, not urgent, it's like, well, that's kind of where I put the filing. 
<laughs> so, you know, I'm amazed. Actually, I cleared off my desk not too long ago, put it all in a box. And it's amazing that I, I, I expected I'd be visiting that box. But it's been in that box for a couple of months now. So, well, you will, you will visit it. Yeah. <laughs> at some point. So the part of the quadrant and the Stephen Covey uh, time management matrix is really four quadrants. And the quadrant on the bottom left, he calls urgent, not important. Like, how could that be? And the way it was explained to me and how I use it now, the urgent, not important is a category that somebody else created for you. They've decided it's urgent and they're trying to make it your important. So it's uh, a child saying to the parent the night before report is due. My report's due tomorrow and I haven't started on it yet. Do you create urgent important out of that? Or do you say, kid, you're on your own? <laughs> you know? um, when you're working in an environment with a lot of people and you've got your tasks set out and you've got your day going, you know exactly what you're going to do and someone raps at the door and they say, ah, we've got to get this report out. And they just got you the information. Right. And now you have to shift here. And you have to look at your task list for the day. And you have to come up with an understanding, okay, well, clearly, there are some things I'm not going to be able to get to today because this other thing has now come into my lap and taken, taken precedence. What on my list has to get done today? And what on my list can I shift to tomorrow? And so creating um, a better relationship with the urgent, the port important, and not so much, I think will go a long way into helping you shrink your to-do lists. Okay, great. Also, one calendar. I don't care what calendar you use. If it's electronic, if it's day calendar, if it's something you hang on your wall, the person I know who has um, a lot, a lot of to-do lists, the next time I go over to her space, we're going to take down all the decorations on her wall and we're putting up a big monthly calendar. Because mm. that's how she said to me just the other day, that worked for her in the past. And this was the first I had heard of this and we've been working together three or four months. And I stopped and went, huh? <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> it worked for you? Why did you stop doing it? Well, the kids wanted to put this up here. I'm like, no, no, no. We're going to find another place for the kids' stuff. Let's get what worked for you back on the wall. Um, but choosing one calendar, choosing one way that you're going to um, make your notes. I'm looking forward to a big, giant touch screen that I can <laughs> use for my Google Calendar and move things over. And <laughs> Some people are using their iPhone for notes. Mm -hmm. The spiral, choose one. And whatever you choose to jot down your to-do list, have them contained in one thing. So if you're not going to use a spiral and if you're not going to use your iPhone, then get a three-ring binder, fill it with paper, and put your Post-it notes on those papers. Hmm. But one thing to reference as you're moving through. And the yellow, I don't, I don't like the yellow. Sorry. Yeah. No, I, I, that's the problem with them is you wind up with them all over the place. Well, and there, I see so many, I walk into so many offices and there are several of these being used at the same time. And they're all in various states of having pages flipped over. And you just, you don't really know what's in, in there. And it, it, I think it's really hard to um, manipulate those. So these are some really good uh, ideas. Uh, we'll uh, put these down. We'll put a link to, again, your, your or, organizing book uh, title again. Psychic Debris, Crowded Closets, The Relationship Between the Stuff in Your Head and What's Under Your Bed. Okay. And you cover some time management in that too? 
I do. I have I have uh, Steve Covey's Matrix in there. Oh, okay, great. And we'll put a link to the, when we find where Steve Covey's Matrix is. We'll put a link to that as well. So. Okay, great. That'll help people a lot. Okay. Well, thanks so much for uh, for oh, talking with us. Oh, it was a pleasure. Us. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Bye bye.